it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome Joshua Chernus to our seminar on political thought and intellectual history. Um, Josh is an associate professor at Georgetown University. His work focuses on European and American political thought in the 20th century uh, and gravitates to the interplay between political ethics, philosophies of history, and liberal thought. Uh, his most recent book, Liberalism in Dark Times, The Liberal Ethos in the 20th Century, uh, which came out in 2021 from Princeton University Press, uh, reinterprets debates between enemies and defenders of liberalism in the 20th century as centered on questions of political ethics, and, and particularly on the validity or virtuousness of ruthlessness as a political disposition. In it, he reveals how a group of politically engaged liberal thinkers, Max Weber, Reinhold Niebuhr, Raymond Aron, Albert Camus, and Isaiah Berlin, responded to the challenge of anti-liberalism by articulating, advocating, and exemplifying a liberal political ethos uh, defined by a particular sensibility, temperament, and set of dispositions and values applied to political conduct. Josh is also the author of A Mind in Its Time, the development of Isaiah Berlin's political thought, which came out from Oxford uh, in 2013, of many articles and book chapters on Berlin, Weber, Niebuhr, and other figures in 20th century political thought. Uh, he was the co-editor of the Cambridge Companion to Isaiah Berlin, uh, which came out in 2018. Um, in addition to further work on Berlin's thought, he's currently in the early stages of work on two larger projects, uh, one concerning the theory and practice of political resistance in authoritarian societies, drawing particularly on the experience of communist Eastern Europe, and another exploring the role of philosophies of history in liberal thought. So today, uh, Josh will present his paper, Liberalism Beyond Institutions, um, as usual, our format will be that Josh will spend some time uh, introducing his paper, and then we'll turn to questions and discussion. Uh, please signal, signal to me if you would like to, to ask a question. Um, also, because today's talk will be uh, recorded, uh, when you do ask a question, we will pass the, the microphone to you. Uh, so without further ado, Josh Trent. Okay, th thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and thanks to Charlie for the invitation and for, for organizing this. And. Um, I would normally be eager to jump into the conversation as quickly as possible, but I understand since this is being recorded and those viewing it won't, won't have had access to the paper, I'll do a little more um, summary than I, I normally would. So apologies to those who have read the paper and will be hearing some of this for a second time. Um, I also wanted to say a little bit about the background to this paper. This grows out of the book project that, that Charlie referred to, Liberalism in Dark Times. And as I was working on that project, I came to understand, came to recognize that the project was advancing both a certain picture of what liberalism is and a certain picture of the history of liberal thought in the 20th century, which went against a number of received views, which, which challenged certain received views. And I didn't set out to challenge these views, but I, I did find, as I was presenting my ideas in, in a fairly naive way, um, as simply just what I perceived, um, that it was causing a certain amount of puzzlement and resistance. And so I then found myself thinking about this, and as often happens, reacting against it um, and, and digging my heels in about what I was doing that was different from the received picture. And the received picture, I think, can be characterized as seeing liberalism in more institutional or institutionalist terms. Um, so to some extent, this paper is um, just reflecting on and developing more directly um, what I, I see as one of the things that I was semi-consciously doing in previous work. This paper also, of course, um, has a certain significance, although it's for you rather than for me to say what its significance or usefulness is um, here now, uh, where we have a reminder of the value and importance of liberal institutions, which I certainly don't want to minimize at all. Um, the danger of the dysfunction or absence of liberal institutions, um, and also a reminder of the need for individuals and groups to go beyond institutions um, to fight for those institutions' survival. Now, liberalism is on I, what I take to be a fairly widely received view uh, associated with institutions. And by institutions, I mean basically systems of human agents interacting in ways governed by rules 
procedures and prescribed roles. And we can see this association between liberalism and institutions from the very start of liberalism, the institutional and particularly constitutional projects um, and theories of early liberals up to John Rawls's identification of liberal, a liberal theory of justice as the first, as justice being the first virtue of institutions, as well as more realist thinkers who define themselves to some extent against Rawls, but still see what Jeremy Waldron calls political political theory as being concerned with constitutional and legal orders. And I think the idea here is that a lot of the non-institutional stuff of human life um, should be seen as existing outside of politics and outside of the liberal project, or the project at least of liberal theory. And there are good reasons for this, at least depending on how we understand liberalism. And in the paper I go through probably too much uh, discussion of how one might define liberalism and why one might want to define liberalism, but in these remarks I'll just go with um, a definition or characterization of liberalism that I hope people will, will at least grant for, for the sake of starting the conversation, um, where liberalism is seen as, first of all, committed to preserving a maximal degree of individual freedom, individual freedom understood primarily as the ability to make choices about one's own life, the maximal amount of individual freedom compatible with similar freedom for others, and the preservation of a society in which such freedom is regarded as permissible and as to some extent sacrosanct. Second, a suspicion or fear of all absolute or unchecked power and commitment to a politics defined by the project of dividing and limiting power. And thirdly, an acceptance of plurality and conflict as features of social life combined with a quest to find ways of medi mediating and stabilizing, but not suppressing conflict. Now, if we grant this definition, it, sh it should be fairly intuitive to see liberals as favoring institutional frameworks, institutional frameworks that can limit power and safeguard personal freedom and provide channels or outlets for rendering conflict more mediable, more stable. And my liberals would also be suspicious of political projects that go beyond in a, an institutional framework. For it is often thought the alternative to rule through institutions is rule by the will of individuals. That is arbitrary rule with the, its connotations of willfulness, injustice, unpredictability, and insecurity. Liberalism has also been identified with what we might call institutionalism, that is to say a tendency to identify politics with, or reduce it to, the fair, regular, and neutral operation of systems of rules, and connected to this a politics marked by a certain ethos characterized by legalism, formalism, proceduralism, rationalism, and ethical neutrality. But historically, this has not been the way that self-described liberals have tended to operate. Liberals have seldom limited their political vision or prescriptions to institutions, and have indeed been anxious about the limits of institutions and the dangers of institutionalism. And to the extent that there is a focus on institutions, the focus has always been intertwined with questions of character development, both what kinds of character development institutions will foster and what kinds of character, character development are necessary for institutions to flourish. In the paper, I offer a very brief and broad overview of two moments of this, one a sort of prolonged and vaguer moment in the 19th century, and then secondly, a, a somewhat more limited moment in the 20th. And the first account on, of 19th century thought draws heavily on work by others and merely repeats um, by now, I think, well-established points, at least among some experts, that first of all, 19th century liberals recognized that sustaining liberal institutions required certain features of personal character, values, and conduct, and the liberal order needed to ensure that these somehow emerged. And second, that promoting a liberal vision of good character 
of independent, self-controlled, tolerant, responsible, and civic-minded individuals was a goal of many, if not most, liberals. And that to the extent that liberals embraced certain institutions, such as parliamentary government, um, they did so with a view to fostering a certain kind of character and culture. The discussion of the second moment draws on my previous work, which Charlie has mentioned, um, to make the case that contrary to a familiar historical narrative, liberal thinkers did not move away um, from this focus on character and towards a narrowly institutionalist and neutralist orientation after World War II. And second, following from this, that the contrast between a perfectionist, positive, thick, morally demanding and ethically ambitious liberalism and a minimalist, negative, thin, proceduralist liberalism, so beloved by many historians and critics of liberalism, is far too tidy. That there's a strand of liberalism that is both ethically rigorous or demanding and oriented towards personal character and conduct, um, but that is also determinedly anti-perfectionist, pluralistic, and self-questioning. So, so that the idea that there is a sort of split between a more ambitious, perfectionist, character-oriented liberalism and a thin, skeptical, pessimistic, minimalist, and institutionalist liberalism is wrong. That it, It's lumping together things that should be disaggregated. And in, in the paper, I draw on several 20th century thinkers to try to illustrate this. And I'll talk about only a few of them in the remainder of my remarks here. Um, this type of liberalism goes beyond institutions largely for negative and protective reasons. First of all, because institutions can't be self-sustaining, self-motivating, or self-guiding. They rely on a, a degree of fidelity to process and to principles and a capacity for both self-restraint and persuasion of individuals working within them. And if individuals do not live up to these demands, then the institutions collapse or become perverted. And institutions are also insufficient not only to sustain themselves, but to reform or transform themselves in the face of the mutability and instability of political affairs. The exercise of judgment, imagination, and will is always necessary to make institutions work, but this is especially true in times of rapid dramatic change or crisis. Furthermore, institutionalism poses its own dangers to political freedom, individuality, and political and moral judgment. Over-reliance on institutional guidelines and procedures can lead to an atrophy of the capacity for judgment, of compassion for, and connection to others, something which, by the way, is of central concern in Charlie's book, um, and of a sense of personal integrity which are often necessary guards against both folly and inhumanity in liberal or other political orders. Over-reliance on institutions and a propensity to institutionalism may he, he be damaging for many kinds of politics, but it poses particular problems for liberalism. And this seems most plausible, perhaps, if we do think of liberalism in more perfectionist terms, if we think of liberalism as aiming at the cultivation of a particular sort of individual excellence, the development of a particular sort of autonomous, thoughtful, self-developing character. But even thinkers who conceive of liberalism's purpose in more negative terms could stress and have stressed liberalism extreme, liberalism's extreme moral demandingness. Thus, for Ortega y Gasset, liberalism represented, and I quote, the loftiest endeavor towards its common life because it carries to the extreme the determination to have consideration for one's neighbor. Liberalism required that individuals maintain a severe discipline over themselves in interactions with others. It requires the state to limit itself even at its own expense, to leave room for those to live who neither think nor feel as it does, as the dominant community does. Liberalism was thus, to, to quote somewhat extensively, the supreme form of generosity, the noblest cry that has ever resounded on this planet. It announces the, term, the determination to share existence with the enemy. More than that, with an enemy which is weak. It was it's incredible that the human species should have arrived at so noble an attitude, so paradoxical, so refined, so acrobatic, so anti-natural, 
Hence, it is not to be wondered that at this time humanity should soon appear anxious to get rid of it. It is a discipline too difficult and complex to take firm root on Earth. Share our existence with the enemy? Govern with the opposition? Is not such a form of tenderness beginning to seem incomprehensible? This over a century ago. And since we're in Jerusalem, it may be fitting to recall a similar, though somewhat different, set of demands or conception of liberalism's demanding this from a liberal Zionist, or actually from two of them, since these are words that were drafted by Isaiah Berlin, but delivered by Chaim Weizmann, who, who declared that um, Israel must be devoted, and I quote, against the heroics of suicidal violence, I urge the courage of endurance, the heroism of superhuman restraint. I admit that self-restraint requires stronger character, more virile nerves than are needed for acts of violence. Whether they can rise to that genuine courage above the moral cowardice of terrorism is a challenge which history issues to our youth. And finally, Judith Schlar, a redoubtable skeptic, certainly not a proponent of perfectionism, um, stressed that liberalism's refusal to impose creedal unanimity and uniform standards of behavior demanded, quote, an enormous degree of self-control. Tolerance consistently applied is more difficult and morally more demanding than repression. Far from being an amoral free-for-all, liberalism is, in fact, extremely difficult and constraining. For it puts enormous burdens of choice upon all of us and imposes extraordinary ethical difficulties, these being far too demanding for those who cannot endure contradiction, complexity, diversity, and the risks of freedom. And institutions alone could not furnish the resources to sustain this morally strenuous way of living with difference and disagreement, nor could the mere functioning of institutions provide enough reward or, or enough satisfaction to inspire people to live with the severe burdens of liberalism. But this raises a problem. For, for as Schlar noted, liberals, or at least more skeptical, humble, and pluralistic liberals, refuse to impose moral excellence through coercion or systematic conditioning. The liberal state, to again quote Schlar, can never be di didactic in intent. It should not engage in a directly educative project of enforcing beliefs or creating specific kinds of character. And this is what I, I've elsewhere termed the liberal problem of pedagogy. And this problem is generated if we assume, first of all, that realizing the goods at which liberals aim, or merely sustaining liberal democracy itself, requires the cultivation of a certain spirit or a certain character on the part of many, though not all, citizens. But second, that attempts to impose morality through institutions is in tension with the spirit of liberalism itself. And this second assumption may be expanded and its force strengthened by holding that the spirit of liberalism is not simply a matter of having a certain set of characteristics, of dispositions, or of holding certain beliefs, though it may involve both of these, but that it's a more complex, elusive way of being in and responding to the world, a the whole form of life which cannot be attained simply through indoctrination or the habitual instilling of certain habits or dispositions or rules of behavior. So how then to foster the sorts of ethical or characterological and cultural resources that liberalism demands without resorting to indoctrination which will violate liberal ideals and probably not effectively realize liberalism's goals? There are several approaches which I canvass very, very briefly in the paper, and I suggest that none are fully convincing or guaranteed to succeed, but that all might have some utility or, or some effect. One envisions a sort of pedagogy of double effect. That is to say, institutional arrangements should not aim to foster character or conduct or judgment directly, but they should be set up so that they will endorse or incentivize the formation of certain forms of character indirectly. And I suggest that, that this is not um, terribly persuasive, even though many liberals have hoped that this might work. A second approach looks to the ethically nurturing effects of practices that appeal to the sentiments and imagination, um, literature being a particularly potent and among many liberal thinkers popular means, so there, there are others. 
A third complementary approach looks to persuasion via rational argument, to different forms of public deliberation as a kind of school of character. A fourth is, which I talk about a bit more extensively in the book, um, is an approach of exemplifying certain features of character and conduct that conduce to liberalism through, through, the, through one's own mode of being in public life, um, whether that means one's mode of being in thinking or writing or in political action, thus offering what Nancy Rosenblum, Charlie and my teacher, um, calls a public education in liberty through the force of one's own example. However it is done, and for all the very real problems it poses, I do want to conclude that going beyond institutions is important for a sustainable liberalism. Our institutions, like ourselves, will never be perfectly wise or just, and they may compound and calcify our injustices and unwisdom by providing excuses to shuffle our responsibility onto. Liberal constitutionalism cannot survive through constitutions alone. It requires actions by individuals and groups in civil society moved by a constitutional, constitutionalist ethos or identity. The performance of action, cultivation of character, and refinement of judgment beyond institutions is needed to provide direction and meaning, which institutions alone cannot to sustain the forbearance, respect, and active defense of the rights of others for which institutions are necessary but not sufficient, and to preserve qualities of independence, individuality, and resistance to an unthinking proceduralism or normalization, which are all necessary to act without, beyond, and sometimes against institutions. And I'll, I'll close the prepared remarks there. Um, so, I, much like uh, Levis and Katznelson, see liberalism as continuous with republicanism. Mm -hmm. um, at least uh, modern uh, Enlightenment era republicanism. And from that perspective, it seems kind of obvious that mm -hmm. you know, thinkers like John Stuart Mill would think both of institutions and of uh, character. Um, it's direct continuation of a very long and old conversation about good laws and good men or good citizens. Um, so seeing from that, that perspective, the puzzle is really who thinks differently and why? <laughs> uh, and how has it come about that uh, some liberals uh, you know, have de-emphasized <laughs> that part of, of politics? So I was wondering if uh, you'd like to say anything about that. Yes, well, this is, is calling on me to, to exercise a, a very liberal virtue of, of trying to understand and sympathize with my opponents, na namely those, those who move in this direction. I think, I think that um, part of it is actually drawing from the Republican tradition and that there is, is also this tension in Republicanism where there is this emphasis on civic virtue and character, but there is also a strong institutionalist tendency. And I think that um, to some extent there's always a tension in most forms of political thought or most schools of political thought between an emphasis on institutions and an emphasis on character, partly because um, I think human beings have difficulty holding both sides of an issue sort of in the equal equilibrium. And there's a tendency to try to put all of one's eggs in one basket or another. I also think that there is an element um, that's important in what does force this transition from early modern republicanism to liberalism um, for all of the continuities, which is, um, the American societies, which are much larger, less culturally cohesive, and where people are bound much more by market exchanges. Um, and the market is really, in many ways, a model of something that, that is heavily institutional and that prioritizes more, in many ways, institutionalist ways of interacting. Um, over more ethical ones, even though I think the market does involve a certain ethics. Um, and I think that that then becomes 
reinforced in the 20th century by the rise not only of the market as a major way that individuals relate to one another, but then the, um, I would say, retreating from, from liberal even-handedness to, to my own um, partisan position, um, the usurpation of prominence or the usurpation of, of the sort of paradigm of political and social science by economics. Um, and I think that when one sees particularly Anglo-American political thought and social thought um, become heavily dominated by ideas from and approaches from economics, that has a lot to do with this shift towards institutionalism. Also, as one sees a transformation in economics from the old political economy to the modern, um, much more mechanistic approach to um, to politics. Um, I'm perhaps overly influenced by the last thing that I, I've read, but I, I was recently reading um, discussions of this transition within the economics profession. So I, I do think that um, that plays a role. I, I also think that um, there were things that were deeply troubling about the ethical rigorism of earlier liberalism, and I talk about this a little more in the paper, that the identification of the liberal project with a certain elite morality, um, its association with projects of imperialism and eugenics that were justified in connection to this idea of you know, the, the pro production or cultivation of excellence, um, that did lead to a reaction. Uh, and I think one of the reactions was one that I've tried to chart, which is to remain heavily focused on questions of character and citizenship, but to just say that the problem is the particular model of elite, monistic, moral excellence. Um, but there is this other response, which is to just try to get away from thinking about and making, making morally rigorous demands of um, characterological excellence. Uh, years ago, I heard a talk uh, by uh, Amy Goodman, um, and Pocock was in the audience, and she was giving a talk about liberalism, especially referencing Rawls' liberalism. And Pocock gets up at some point and says, what's this liberalism thing you keep talking about? Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the way I understood Pocock's point, being an intellectual historian, is he was saying that what you, you, you have here a uh, reification that's mm -hmm. not historically, uh, properly contextualized historical fiction. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember what her response was, but I'm wondering what your response might be to that kind of a comment. So is this a his, or in other words, I, I thought to me you said, well, one might define or want to define liberalism. Mm -hmm. I can imagine someone like Pocock saying, well, why should one want to define liberalism? Mm -hmm. I mean, if maybe you want to define it if you're trying to make some kind of normative argument and you're using a definition to make the argument. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's a very good question. And I do um, spend some time in, in the paper addressing this and, and trying to explain why I want to define liberalism and why I want to define it the way that I do. I think that, that part of it is um, that talking about liberalism is something that we do and that has become central and common in our particular discursive neighborhood of political theory. And that there's a great deal of confusion and a lot of debates that I think become very um, muddled and not very productive with people talking about liberalism without agreeing on what it means. Um, so I partly start from just the position that not talking about liberalism is going to be very difficult for political theorists, certainly for Anglo-American political theorists, and I think political theorists more broadly um, these days. And rather than trying to dispense with it, um, with dispense with the 
category of liberalism, we should just try to use the term more precisely and define it more explicitly. And then there's the question of, okay, how are we going to define it? Um, and what are going to be the criteria for defining it? And there are different approaches, and I think different approaches are appropriate for different kinds of projects. And this is something that Duncan Bell in, in his widely influential essay, What is Liberalism Says, is that you know, he, as a Cambridge, kind of Cambridge School historian, um, wants to do a particular thing with the term, um, but that there are other, other scholarly protocols, as he calls them, appropriate for different projects. In my case, I want to use liberalism to pick out a certain tendency, a certain way of thinking, of conceiving of politics, of being in the world, that I think is important and that I think is an important dividing line within our politics. Um, in that I think that you can distinguish between, I mean, the, you know, the old joke, there are two kinds of people in the world, those who think that there are two kinds of people in the world and those who don't. Um, you know, I, I think there, there are two kinds of people in, in politics, one of which I think we can identify by the term liberal. Um, and that is characterized by this combination of self-restraint and insisting on certain limits or restraints on the exercise of political power and an emphasis on individual freedom and the necessary disunity and diversity that that is going to produce, certainly under modern conditions. And I think that in a lot of political debates, you can see a meaningful cleavage between the liberals and the non-liberals. Um, so trying to, A, make sense of simply that cleavage within our politics, and then of both the reasons for and implications of these different approaches or these different attitudes towards politics or ways of being in politics, I think is a useful way to utilize the term liberal. I also, and, and this is a way in which I, I differ from Bell, I do want to use the term in a more normative way and in a more prescriptive way because I want to be able to say something that, that I think Bell would rule out saying, um, which is that one can be more or less liberal or one, one can be more or less truly liberal. Um, I want to be able to say that there are certain self-described liberals um, or people that we might describe as liberals who are just not being very liberal or who are not being very good at being liberal. Um, liberals who exhibit, self-described liberals who exhibit um, traits of intolerance or overweening um, desire for power um, or lack of respect for the demands of respecting individual liberty. Um, and so I do think that both in distinguishing between liberalism or liberals and non-liberals um, and distinguishing between more or less consistent or successful ways of being liberal, the, the term does have a use today, now, in certain um, discursive contexts. And you know, I think that it's true that um, when you try to uh, identify a single liberalism stretching across time and space, um, you find that there, there is just a lot of variety, um, which is the same of various terms. Um, you can say the same thing about republicanism uh, or democracy or conservatism, um, et cetera. Can I just quickly? Please, please. please. Um, so, yeah, so you're interested in explaining the concept, in defining it, making it clear what this concept means, uh, uh, sort of just doing an analysis of the concept, but you're also making a normative argument on top? You're doing yeah. yeah, yes, and, and also in different, different projects. Um, I'm doing both. So in what I would consider to be more thoroughly historical projects, um, I'm concerned with working out what 
liberalism meant or how the term was used and the different things that it meant um, and the way that the term was, the definition of the term was argued over by particular historical actors. Um, when I'm doing what I think of as a, more of a kind of political theory, um, I'm interested, as I, I said, in trying to use the term to pick out a certain position or set of practices that can be both analyzed and evaluated, um, and evaluated as being more or less coherent. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I wanted to ask, I guess, two questions that are related. Um, the first is, um, kind of in light of 2022, democratic backsliding and all these things, um, uh, what what do you think, or, or what, what insights do you have from political theory about how to respond when there are uh, certain segments of the population who, uh, who who don't go by these these liberal norms? Like, is this a collection act, act, a collective action problem, where basically all of a sudden, you know, liberals have to be more coercive in education or things like that, or um, you know, is this a sort of I don't know, turn the other cheek, you know, continue being liberal and eventually it'll work? Um, and and the second question is uh, out of out of countries today that that you see. As have maintained a, a liberal ethos, um, which of those four strategies that you laid out before of kind of ways of solving the liberal paradox uh, do you see as having been most effective, or that are most effective, or is it a combination of all of them? I think I, I think those those two questions are, are clearly closely associated, um, and I think that what what strategy or what approach is most effective is going to very much depend on the situation at hand. And one thing that I worry about is that I see good reasons to think that um, none of these strategies will be very effective in um, the, the context that I'm most familiar with or, or um, that are most immediate, partly because I think um, the, the strategies of more um, emotional or, or imaginative persuasion, um, or rational persuasion and exemplification all rely on at least some degree of agreement, or if not agreement, then at least openness and convincibility about what might constitute admirable or desirable characters or states of being. And I think that um, in many cases, the divisions have just become so entrenched. And pe people have, to some extent, I think, become very sophisticated in their ways of refusing to listen to one another, um, their, their ways of discrediting the opposition. Um, you know, the, the fact that uh, American conservatives are able to now mobilize tremendously sophisticated postmodern ideas about the social construction of fact um, to basically cut off any possibility of being challenged. Um, so I'm not sure uh, what, what exactly would work. I think, I think that it's still worth trying all of these things um, and thinking about how, given the situation at hand and given the tools at hand, we might be able to use them. Um, and for, for thinking about that, uh, I'm not sure that a political theorist is the best person to do it, but one would want to bring in you know, communications scholars and psychologists to, to think more about it. But I think that um, certainly the, the alternatives that you mentioned of uh, the, the fighting fire with fire approach and the turning of the other cheek approach, um, both I, I think are, are wrong-headed. Um, I think that if you try to fight fire with fire, you just wind up burning down everything that's of value. Um, but turning the other cheek is um, to be, I think, too passive in things. I, I think that what is really needed um, is a degree of creativity and a degree of creativity about policies and political strategies and political practices that will be consistent with basic liberal values 
basic liberal ideals, but that still might depart quite significantly from the policies that liberals have favored in the past. And th this is, again, something with a, a historical uh, precedent in, in the period that I, I'm interested in. Um, in the 1930s, people thought that, li many people thought that liberalism was doomed. And one line of response, which some of the people I write about um, advocated, was to say, liberalism needs to identify what, or liberals, I should say, need to identify what values really matter to them, and then think of wholly new economic policies and perhaps wholly new political institutions um, to pursue those policies or those, those ideals. And out of this grows in many ways, the modern welfare state, certainly um, New Deal policies, in Europe a lot of social democratic policies, um, based on this sense that you need to have radical policy and institutional innovation to respond to the very real failures of liberal institutions and liberal policies, um, but not to abandon the underlying ideals, including ideals of character, um, that have been important to liberalism. And so I, I think that um, recognizing the severe crises um, that modern societies face and the need to respond to these in ways that um, liberal parties, liberal politicians have not been adequately doing um, without embracing the, the ethos of anti-liberal movements um, is, is a very vague way of putting it, but as I say, I'm a political theorist. That, that's un, ungenerous and unfair to other political theorists. I am the kind of political theorist um, who, who does not get down to brass tacks. Thanks. Uh, my question is really related to, to the previous one. It, it's all also about uh, the, the historical context mm. and the way that, uh, that our uh, how we regard, uh, you know, the liberalism, the definition and and the mm. strategies for a, a reason about it depends on on the context. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about uh, you know, crisis and, and war and mm -hmm. uh, how. I mean, ironically, I mean, uh, I just wanted to ask. I mean, I, I always feel that after World War II, it was really relatively easy to argue in favor of liberalism and persuade and didn't need much in mm -hmm. order to persuade the people. Um, so I guess, what's the question here? Uh, do you think crisis is something that <laughs> might change the mm. way that... Uh, I think that a, a crisis um, always presents certain opportunities that um, different political actors, different political innovators can take in one direction or another. And so I think that you know, crisis can um, remind people of the horrors of the alternatives to liberalism and the, the importance of certain basic liberal norms and ideals and institutions um, that you know, if, if the alternative is endless sectarian civil war, if the alternative is genocide, um, if the alternative is totalitarian rule, then liberalism may look much more attractive and, and the argument in favor of liberalism may be much easier to make. Um, but I think you still do need to have skillful politicians, skillful political leadership to make that case. Um, I don't think that human beings will necessarily prefer um, peace to war or freedom to oppression unless they can be inspired or convinced by people to, to make the case and, and to offer hope um, that peace and freedom are actually viable. Um, Charlie mentioned a, a future project that I, I the, the 
the bio that you read out was, was written at an earlier, more optimistic phase when, when I had these, these big, big future projects in mind. But one thing that I, I am interested in is how much um, the success of different liberal theories and practices really depends on a, on a degree of historical optimism or historical hopefulness um, and the ability to um, inspire people to believe that actually um, the future could be steadily and continuously better um, than what we, we face. And I think it's, that, that is a difficult belief to sustain now. And I worry that um, with the loss of historical optimism, uh, liberalism is going to be far harder to sustain and one of, one of the reasons why I both am very uh, tempted by this project or interested in this project and also um, have, have yet to undertake it is I, I think I'm very uncertain about what the answer will wind up being. Um, I'd, I'd like to try to articulate a liberalism that does not rely on historical optimism, but that may be very difficult. To, um, to actually sustain. Um, but I think that one thing, and, and here I, I revert to a, a certain um, American tradition of pragmatism, uh, one thing that is very important is showing an ability to articulate, recognize, and offer solutions to present problems um, that if political leaders or movements can say, these are the problems that we face and these are the solutions to them that we're offering, um, then I think they're going to be much more successful. I think that one of the problems today is that A, there is so little agreement on the nature of the problems that we face to the extent that um, I think it, it, it is painfully obvious that one of the fundamental and most pressing problems faced by humanity is climate change, but I have many um, fellow citizens who don't believe that's a problem at all. Um, and there's also just drastic disagreement on what would constitute a solution to the problems that we face. And as I said before, we, we seem to have become so closed off to um, one another's suggestions for how to think about and how to solve the problems before us, I think it, it will be very difficult for, um, for any political movement or party or leader to, to come and say, you know, let, let's unite behind this agenda or behind this policy to, to solve this problem. I think there's, there's a degree of um, resignation and hopelessness, um, which one also sees here um, about the, the situation here, um, that I think is, is deeply politically uh, paralyzing. And I think the only way now um, to sustain liberalism is to uh, convince people that liberalism can be tied to some kind of solution to the problems facing us, and it's not clear how that, that'll happen. I will also say that for, for intellectuals, it's often unclear how problems will be solved or addressed until after they have been. <laughs> um, that, that's one, one source of hope, you know, Owl of Minerva and all that, um, that you know, politicians, uh, ideologists occasionally do just emerge and come up with messages and come up with um, actual plans um, that we have not been able to foresee at all. Yeah. Is it a unique problem for liberalism or is it a problem for, in, in general terms, in, uh, for any sort of political conduct in terms of, say, you're a socialist, you're a Republican, you're a conservative, you want your political conduct to express some values and you also want to get power. And mm -hmm. sometimes you need to choose. Not everything that helps you towards getting power expresses your political values. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a dilemma. So is this a unique 
dilemma for liberalism, or is in general a dilemma about how how anybody uh, should conduct in politi politics to put ahead the project or to put ahead the expression of your political ethos? Mm. So that's my question. Yeah, good. Well, I, th I think that it, it first of all it is a uh, as you suggest, a problem for for anyone who thinks about politics in terms of some kind of ideology or morality. For, in other words, and anyone who does have this sense that there are these separate demands of achieving power and realizing some larger good or some set of ideals um, that might be expressed or lived out in politics that's separate from sheer political power, sheer political success. So I think already um, there are some who would just not distinguish between ends and means or distinguish between the acquisition of power and the expression of values. But I think even within that subset of people who think about politics in, in this way where um, there, there is a concern of, and there's a real felt pull of both the, the idea of the expression of values in action and the, the achievement of, of good results. Um, I think that it, it is a problem for different ideologies, but liberalism especially, um, insofar as liberalism is, again, as, as I'm, I'm defining it here, um, and I do think that there, there is a particular approach to politics which one can characterize as liberal. Um, there, there is within this liberal outlook a particular tendency to identify and, and emphasize a gap between the acquisition of power and the realization or, or the expression of certain ideals precisely because there is such a an intrinsic fear and distrust of power and emphasis on the importance of protecting individual freedom against power. So, so in other words, a liberal emphasis on individual rights, on individual choice, on a plurality or diversity of different perspectives means that there's always going to be an intrinsic tension between the acquisition of power and the realization of certain liberal goals, liberal goals of, say, justice or, or fairness, um, or consensus over liberal, liberal ideals themselves, um, and the expression of, of the spirit of liberalism or the, or the values of liberalism. Um, I think that a, a complete conquest of power, monopoly on power, uh, sort of cultural and moral monopoly where everyone in society becomes a good liberal um, is actually something that many liberals would be averse to in a way that isn't the case with conservatives or socialists. Um, I think that, you know, certainly in many forms of socialism, the, for, for all of its virtues, the, there's no problem with the idea. In fact, part of, part of the ideal is that everyone will become motivated by the same unselfish, socially oriented, from each according to his ability to each according to her needs, ethos or set of principles. Um, I think that that degree of unity, unanimity, cohesion um, is actually something that many liberals um, have severe worries about or scruples about. And so there is, I think, something within liberalism that is particularly prone to these worries. Um, the the uh, old, old uh, quip by Robert Frost about, you know, liberal is someone who is too broad-minded to take his own side in an argument, um, I think is, is true to some extent. Um, and so there is this particular problem for liberals, um, something that, that you know, goes back to 
um, John Stuart Mill, who's a thinker beset with tensions, but he, he does suggest, you know, even, even if it were the case that all of society came to agree on certain fundamental truths, um, you would still need to have perhaps artificially created devil's advocates just to provide some form of opposition to that. Um, and I, I don't think that that's something that one finds in, in other ideologies in the same way. Uh, I think you can make a convincing case that in order to maintain liberal institutions in society, you also need that a significant amount of <coughs> citizens will share kind of liberal efforts. Mm -hmm. But the question is whether the opposite is true. Because I think historically you can um, think about the cases when you can um, assume that fairly uh, big amount of citizens were kind of possessing this kind of liberal ethos, but uh, the society institutions were not liberal. I can think, for example, about uh, uh, Roman Empire in the classical age, and uh, so you could say, okay, for uh, amount people believe in freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, respect for uh, for the rule of law, and so on. But society mm -hmm. is uh, uh, the state mm -hmm. is not liberal. So, and then uh, your opponent may come and say, okay, if you can't focus too much on uh, on liberal ethos on liberal character it doesn't necessarily lead you to a free and liberal society mm. yeah um and I, th I think that is a danger and one one reason why um i i am not sure exactly uh what i want to do with this paper is that i, I do worry about um, you know, the, the ever-present problem of overstatement, uh, you know, in, in reaction to one exaggerated position take, taking the other exaggerated position. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think that um, it is important to have liberal institutions, and, and this it goes back to actually a Republican point, um, that there is something really troubling and, and something both very risky um, and also something very demeaning about one's freedoms being dependent on uh, the, the whim of a ruler or, or the temporary forbearance of a ruler. Um, that, that's one reason why I think very often when you have these sort of, we could say, socially and culturally liberal oligarchies or empires, um, there's always a degree of, of instability there and in a, in a push against that um, perhaps tolerant um, or at least ineffectually um, authoritative or, or intolerant, but, but still unaccountable and unconstrained, institutionally unconstrained authority. Um, I think that, you know, there's also um, within some forms of liberalism, though not all, an emphasis on the importance of a certain sense of civic responsibility, which I think is hard to inculcate or sustain if one doesn't actually have any political power. Uh, so I think that this is a problem for um, some proponents of a kind of liberalism where most of the actual power um, is held by an elite of judges or bureaucrats or what have you. Um, I, I am very strongly, like, like most good American liberal academics, um, very strongly opposed to a, a lot of the, the current populist tendencies in politics, but uh, one point of slight difference for many of my colleagues is that uh, while I was very unhappy about Brexit, I'm, I'm less pro-EU than many, many of, of my comrades um, because I think that th there was this degree, uh, there is this degree of political disempowerment and irresponsibility um, within the EU model of increasingly legalistic and bureaucratized rule um, that does have, I think, damaging cultural, moral implications. So I, I do think that um, there, there are real problems with sustaining 
a liberal ethos without liberal institutions and um, also real dangers uh, to liberal freedoms um, without liberal institutions. So I certainly don't want to um, advocate only um, a liberal ethos and not also um, a commitment to a liberal institutional framework. Okay, I think I'll ask a question. Um, so Josh, as you know, I'm very broadly sympathetic to uh, your project. Um, I want to return to the end um, of the paper and end of your remarks, kind of talking about the, the proposed solutions or possibilities for dealing with um, the, the problem of pedagogy. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to add two more uh, possibilities and just, just add, see what you think of them. Uh, they're not original to me. Um, the first is the role of associational life um, and civil society. I mean, obviously, membership and associations can produce all sorts of different kinds of characteristics and dispositions, some of which are conducive to liberalism and some of which are not. But there's an argument to be made, you know, starting with Tocqueville and extending through, through Nancy uh, Rosebloom, um, with, with that associational life itself, just participation in it, um, regardless of the character of the association, uh, can have a positive effect. Uh, for, for inculcating the liberal ethos. So I just wanted to uh, curious about what you think of that. And the other is um, civil religion. Mm -hmm. And civil religion is, is complicated for your argument because it, it risks the kind of a form of tutelary state, right? I mean, you mm -hmm. have something which is coming in some ways from the state downward. Um, but the argument of proponents of civil religion as well, you know, it's broad enough, it's general enough, it's tolerant enough that it's really not tutelary. It's just, you know, kind of a way of bringing people together and, and of encouraging pro-social behavior. So I'm just curious what you think of those, those two possibilities. Yeah, well, it, it, there, there is in, in that question a, a lot of Rosenblum and a lot of Rousseau, um, which, which is not unpredictable. Um, but, uh, Yes, so, so I think that um, for, first on this associational life, um, th this is of course a very double-edged sword and I think one of the worries about this now is first of all um, just how weak associational life has gotten in, in many ways and I think things from the pandemic to the related to the pandemic but preceding it um, move of increasing amounts of our our social lives online um, and into these very different kinds of communities online um, is a worry and I think it, it's a worry that um, both, both because it may weaken associational life and that people are just much more transient and aren't really uh, immersed in associations and therefore don't have to learn the skills of living with others with whom they disagree um, and finding ways to, to coexist and to preserve some sense of fairness. Uh, together as, as well as some sense of real shared agency um, with one another. There's also a way in which um, how our newer form of, I'm not sure if one wants to call it community, but our new forms of, of meeting with one another uh, and spending time with one another exacerbate certain features of associational life, um, which is you know, sort of internal homogeneity within a very diverse society which um, provides uh, to some extent, this is part of Nancy's point, um, to some extent an escape valve from some of the burdens of a very um, diverse and contentious larger um, civil life, but also can um, foster these habits of not uh, restraining oneself in order to respect others with whom we disagree um, because we're just not spending that much time with them. Uh, we, don't, we don't have to stick around and deal with them and I think that there, there is a decreasing level of just interpersonal tolerance that I see, that I see in myself as well. Um, 
that you know, it is just much, much easier now to um, simply withdraw whenever you encounter someone who sees things differently from you. Um, so I do, I do worry about whether associational life can function just because of the changing nature of the associations. Um, I think that you know, another thing that Nancy has written a lot about, um, neighborhoods and, and neighbors, um, again, you know, particularly during the pandemic, one sees very little of one's neighbors sometimes. And again, there's this idea that we are spending less time living with and, and learning about people where the, the connection is not chosen and therefore forces us to uh, contend with difference in certain ways that we just don't have to anymore. Um, so if, if we can sustain uh, the right sort of associations, that, that would work. I'm not sure that though if, if contemporary circumstances will allow that. With civil religion, um, I think one, one thing that's interesting is as, as I understand it now, um, and I, I owe this to, to the work of a, a number of colleagues, including Brian Garston, who, who you mentioned, and also some of, some of my own students at Georgetown, um, I think that early liberalism, so-called liberalism, emerges in many ways as a reaction against the project of civil religion um, and connected to this notion of a, a, the importance to a liberal society of some sense of religiosity, but the danger of an institutionalized and homogenous and uniform religion. Um, I think that civil religion can mean different things and take different forms, but one worry is that you'll get all of the, the negative features of the church without the actual spiritual solace or inspiration. Um, and I, I, I do think that um, you know, on the one hand, it, it could provide some form of commonality within and across difference, which would be important. But I think, A, there, it's not clear that there is any content to civil religion that could actually unite people in many modern societies. Um, and even if, if there were, um, how consistent that, that could be with liberalism. I mean, you know, Rousseau, of course, um, thinks that to maintain civil religion, one can you know, ostracize and exile those who don't accept it and execute those who accept it and then don't abide by it, which, which is not a, not a very liberal. Um, if, 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 the, if the word has any meaning, I think it's not that. Um, so so um, yeah, I, I think that civil religion um, in certain ways, that being said, one of the figures as, as an American that I, I find endlessly fascinating and compelling is Abraham Lincoln. And you know, Lincoln does articulate a kind of civil religion. Um, he also, importantly, I think, getting, getting back to um, my sort of pet solution, even, even though I'm not sure how effective this can be now, um, of exemplification. I mean, you know, he, he doesn't just preach a civil religion, he, he embodies it in a certain way. Um, and I think, you know, again, not, not enforcing any kind of code or civil theology or, or civil um, liturgy, but just embodying a certain set of values and, and approach, I think is, is consistent with liberalism. Any final questions for Josh? Okay, uh, please join me uh, in thanking Josh. Thank you very much.